go to my text and the text is from uh, the return the quote i would like to read you is from a karen barad who is the person we actually she's a they are a human <laughs> we read most um most of the texts that we're reading in our reading group are by karen barad but even that maybe is a wrong way of putting it because the fracture through Karen Barad are so many other uh, human and more than human voices. And in their writing, there's always uh, often there are other kind of earthlings, um, other creatures, and uh, we're really inspired by their use of the worm. And so that also explains the poster and they write we might imagine, and this is really about doing research and doing research differently. We might imagine returning as a multiplicity of processes. So this is from a paper called Diffracting Diffraction. Diffracting, diffracting, diffracting diffraction. Such as the kinds earthworms revel in while helping to make compost or otherwise being busy at work and at play turning the soil over and over, ingesting and excreting it, tunneling through it, borrowing all means of aerating the soil, allowing, allowing oxygen in, opening it up and breathing new life into it. So this is on page 168 of that paper from 2014. So what we really like about returning as a kind of composting methodology, which comes from uh, Donna Haraway, their, their good friend and colleague um, in Santa Cruz. And it is a, it's a way of doing justice to the intricate detail of, of the kind of spe specific connectivity. So our invitation uh, to people is to return, and it could be any of you here in the room as well, is that we don't, you know, with these kind of events, want people to do endless new kind of presentations, but it's a really a returning to where you've, might have been before before whatever that means but come to it differently so come to it afresh so that is the overall idea so you might like to return uh to your research or uh event and um i'm going to hand you over to roseanne who is going to take over from here and talk a little bit more about uh, who we've got um in the room who's going to do that returning and also how we're going to do it and just a warm welcome to everyone here thanks everyone thank you karen thanks so much for getting us started i'm um i'm actually just going to tell you a little bit about the way we're going to do have spend this time today so if you can imagine we all spend a lot of time on zoom but let's imagine we're in a circle because um, that's possible. And we're going to develop a community of philosophical inquiry. It's actually the pedagogy of something called philosophy with children. It's the way I met Karen many, many years ago in about 2013. And the work that I've spent, the work and play that I have done with my PhD and through my PhD. And so I'll be facilitating our inquiry, which is really a lot about questions and how questions are going to work. So I'm very excited to invite Ezra to start off and I'm not going to introduce him he's going to do this through his first answer to this question that I'm going to ask him um there are four different questions that I'm going to be working with Ezra he's going to have asked one of them himself and there will be time for the audience well you're not an audience for you you as participants in our circle of inquiry to share with us in this next 45 minutes so thank you for coming shift your chair, get into a comfortable position, move the way you feel like you <clears throat> would be most comfortable, and let's enjoy ourselves. So Ezra, I'll start off by asking you to introduce yourself briefly, so maybe that's about five minutes, and by sharing one example from your PhD process, which expresses what worked in terms of either supervision, your research, or you as a PhD student, and then ending that with a question that you have formulated. Thanks, Ezra. Hi. So um, 
Yeah, my name's Ezra. I am a graduate student at Tufts University in the United States. Um, and I'm near the end of my program. Um, and my journey through like towards post qualitative research has sort of just been growing the entire time, but I haven't had a lot of supervision in that way. So it's sort of um, impacted my my progress in particular ways. So I work in STEM education um, <clears throat> and I came in with some ideas about what I wanted to do and those shifted a little bit, but I think the entire time I had a kind of post qualitative sensibility that sort of developed and it was really um, helpful as I, as I carried the, you know, the idea with me that like, no, I think what I'm, what I want to do is not crazy. You know, I read somebody, <laughs> something that made me feel like, no, there are people doing this. And then I would try to talk to my advisors or something, and they would sort of want me to slip into qualitative methodology. Um, as if that's, you know, because I'm a PhD student. So as if that's not something that I, that I was doing wrong, or as if I didn't, know what I was doing, you know, whereas I had this strong sense that, uh, no, what I'm trying to do is on purpose. <laughs> and um, so a little bit more about my research. Um, I, the shortest version might just be that um, I've been involved in a research project where we were investigating students in STEM classrooms doing kind of making projects, like as in maker spaces. Um, in different STEM environments, um, the one that I wound up using a lot of observations and data from was a computational physics course in an undergraduate class. Um, and I started really paying attention to the ways that the students were, you know, both working with each other and really noticing their emotions and feelings and body. And something else that happened that I thought was interesting was that the student's task involved um, building, uh, you know, they had an open-ended prompt to just make an oscillator. And they got to define like what oscillator meant and what, uh, what the story of what it did was. And, so as they were working on it and then trying to like build a computational model, again, like whatever that means for them, <clears throat> I noticed their model kind of, you know, trying to approximate the system, but they would also sort of change their model itself as if the world was kind of moving towards um, them and their description as well. So that kind of two way, movement reminded me of a lot of other literature. And I started thinking about that process in dialogic and discursive terms. And so I started thinking about how science might be framed as um, many different kinds of conversations, conversations with each other, obviously, um, but conversations with material. And that led me to like a, a lot of research on material agency. And conversations sort of within yourself. I think that uh, it's yeah. kind of invisible most of the time, the ways that science especially <clears throat> um, involves a lot of paying attention to your embodied senses as well as your affect. Um, and so what I liked about that framing of conversations was it allowed me to kind of bring a few different areas of re research into one place. And it also made me think of science in a way that was a little bit more compatible with relational ontology. And so for me, that connects that work to uh, all of the work that sort of why you would ever do that, you know, paying attention to the way that your actions impacts other people and thinking of our existence being tied to the relations that we have with others and each move having an inherent like responsibility uh, of how you're going to impact others. 
is a framing for science that I think is not easy for Western approaches to really figure out how to do that, even if you wanted to. So um, this framing of conversations allowed me to get at that a little bit. But what was difficult for me in my research was that that exploration isn't a story of like what's really happening in the classroom. You know, so as I was like trying to write about it, many of my mentors are kind of like, well, what's, what's your evidence that this happened? And like, it was interesting. It just took a long time to figure out like how much, like I really, I'm really not telling that kind of story at all. You know, I'm, I'm more like trying to test like, if we were to think of science in this way, what would that look like, you know? Um, so it's, it's, for me, it's been very important to both explore that framing, but also kind of, it made my dissertation include a lot of like justification for post-qualitative research um, and why the kind of narrative inquiry that I was doing like is itself a kind of approach that belongs in my field. Um, so for me, um, the question that I wanted to put in uh, because it kind of characterizes my um, dissertation process has been like, what brings you to call your work post-qualitative and um, how do you find yourself talking about it? Because I know a lot of people like um, don't necessarily use the word post-qualitative, but what they're doing may be <clears throat> very much aligned. Some people have kind of reaction to that word um, because I think a lot of, qualitative researchers are doing things that are, uh, you know, they're trying to attend to many of the same things that the post qualitative, like critique of representation might like, uh, also be doing. So I think there are some qualitative researchers out there that feel like it's silly to call it post qualitative research, because it's maybe just good qualitative research. Um, and uh, so deciding for myself, like why and what that looks like and what that means, I think has been interesting. So, um, I'm, I'm be really interested just to hear everyone's sort of version of that question and answer. Gosh, thank you, Ezra. Thanks so much for, um, for taking us on your journey and sharing some of, I, th I think you've alluded to some sort of, some of the struggles, um, but thank you for your very pointed question. Before we started, I Googled my PhD and I went post qualitative. <laughs> I won't tell you the response, but it was, <laughs> it's interesting because it's exactly that dilemma. Am I, is it because I say it is, but actually the naming is, is what we're disrupting and contesting always. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is, I, I did want us to first for a moment think about what you said before you asked your question. I wrote quite a few things down. So I'm going to ask if everybody could just kind of go back to what Ezra shared with us about science and how he's been having these conversations, paying attention to embodied senses. Interesting what um, how he framed those conversations, not an exploration. Let's just think for a minute about what Ezra shared with us. And then in the group, if people are comfortable, maybe um, you could kind of it doesn't have to be an answer to the question, but you can engage with the question. There's a philosopher that talks about how questions um, bring about other questions. Walter Cohen often talks about that. So maybe we will that's what we'll try and do next, not answering that necessarily. So for a minute, let's just think about what Ezra, how we got to this point, and then I'll take responses from people in the group. Thank you.
And thank you, Ezra and George have written the question in the group chat. Okay, so would anybody like to offer a, um, we kind of having an opportunity to chat now, and then I'll go back to, there'll be a couple more questions for Ezra. So the one Ezra's formulated for us is what brings you to call your work most qualitative? And how do you find yourself talking about it? Um, yeah, is there anybody that would like to offer a, a way for us to think about that together? Can I, can I follow up with another question? Mm -hmm. And I meet this question with a question. <laughs> you um, may. And my question would be, um, how is the best put? Um, is, there, is there a way in which research is both qualitative and post-qualitative at the very same time? So is it an either or, or is it an at the very same time? Mm -hmm. I'm really happy to respond to that, um, if that's okay. Um, thanks so much for your question, Karen, and also thanks so much, uh, Ezra and Roseanne, for all the, everything that you've shared so far. And just when I heard that thing there about, is there a way that something can be qualitative and post-qualitative at the same time? Uh, that is that is a question that I'm asking myself a lot at the moment. Uh, and I'm very happy to share a little bit more um, just about that, um, because I think it describes um a sort of morphing that I'm undergoing at the moment I kind of feel that I'm morphing between a qualitative um understanding or approach and a post-qualitative one it was interesting Ezra there that you mentioned narrative analysis so I kind of heard a, a qualitative sort of approach there which is obviously changing and that's something that happened to me uh I'm researching um higher education pedagogies yeah. And I was involved in a project last May uh, in which students from the humanities who normally write essays about sociology and, you know, these kind of topics, we challenged them to make a sculpture. And they made that sculpture over about a week. And the results were really amazing. I have to say what they, the students, what they produced was amazing. And I, and I kind of had this experience I saw how the students were able to express themselves and communicate a lot more through those objects. And I also felt a kind of connection with those objects. Like I felt that when I was in that art gallery with those sculptures, I kind of felt that those objects were, I don't want to say they were speaking to me because it sounds a bit out there, but you know, I kind of felt <laughs> like those material objects were, were communicated, I could communicate somehow or inter interact or what I now know could be interacting with them. Um, and it also echoes a little bit what you were saying, Ezra, there about um, dialogue as well, because I, I thought this, I, I'm going to re research this for my doctorate. So I thought, okay, I started researching creativity and I came across uh, a case study by Kerry Chappell that you might have seen, uh, which is about science, arts, pedagogy and dialogue, dialogue and embodiment. So it's kind of those topics you, you were talking about there. And that has a diffractive analysis in there and it also it draws on Barad and so on and that really kind of blew my mind really when I saw how the analysis was done it, it really I thought I can't really go back so I it was I couldn't really unsee what was in that it was a case study so it was qualitative to some degree but it had this other element it, it's somehow more alive and more fresh and more you know something different about it and since then, I've been reading, I've been reading from Barad, but I've also got particularly interested in what a method might be or not. And so I've been reading St. Pierre and Matze and indeed Maris and Bozalek. So it's so nice to be here because I've been reading about, yeah, these are the questions that I've been reading about, about things like becoming and, and all these things that you that you write about. So yeah, so that's me. I feel like I'm becoming 
I'm crossing over somewhere between qualitative and post qualitative. I'm becoming or I'm morphing into something, and that's where I'm at. So that's what I wanted to share uh, today. Could you put the the title and the name of that article in the chat? That would be fantastic. Absolutely, I've got the link here. I'll put this in the chat. Oh, brilliant! Sure. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks so much for sharing that um, and sharing your. Yeah, I suppose the dilemmas that is, you know, it's interesting um, to, to think about because we, does the post call make the qualitative and does the qualitative make the post call? <laughs> because which one, I mean, we, we kind of presume we know which one it is, but there could be a case study that's post qualitative in its engagement. Um, or, Anyway, um, I'm just I'm just thinking about what you're saying, and certainly um, that's always the irony about these moments and times because we're thinking quickly, even though it takes much longer to think usually. Um, I'm going to ask Elizabeth, and then after Elizabeth shares, I know we're all going to be by then very enthralled, but I'm going to ask after Elizabeth for us to go back to Ezra and finish those two questions, and then if you don't mind, so and I do see that we have two in the chat as well, so or two comments, so. Um, Elizabeth, you may you go. can go back. I can ask my question after. That's no problem. Okay, I'll just read. I'll just I'll just read the two. I think they're more comments. Hilary Janks wrote, "I'm amused by how the wheel turns. I'm old enough to remember when we had to defend qualitative research when scientific positive res positivist research was the dominant paradigm." And I mean, Hilary's only twenty five, so that's incredible. And then Julie. <laughs> <laughs> um, Julie has written, speaking to me, thingly power. Thanks, Julie. And David has kindly entered the, well, thanks, David. We'll, re, we'll use that re, um, reference. Um, thanks, Elizabeth. Do you want to, oh, shame, you want to unmute yourself and go ahead? Yep. Um, when, when you were talking, Ezra, I was talking, I was thinking about PhD supervision and how and where do you make the shift between qualitative and post qualitative and I'm in Prince Edward Island in Canada um, and how many people do post qualitative. Uh, my supervisor definitely does, but my committee are tr we're trying to convince the committee as much as we can, um, which makes it complicated uh, i'm working on uh, research ethics application at the moment, and that's where i'm seeing uh, the shift between wanting to be post qualitative but having to fit within academia and the those that read the research so do i do i want them to say yes i need to bridge the gap somehow for them for the qualitative world so i speak in qualitative terms <laughs> but i try to hide i sprinkle post qualitative within so i think that that's my struggle as much as uh, that's my struggle it, and that's where i i have to keep bridging the gap for the committee for research, for the public, when I speak, what I talk about, what I do, and who I am, uh, it's a little bit. You open the door. How much do you open it? How much do you get into it? So that's where I feel like I'm. I kind of live between two worlds. Hmm. This maybe might be worth knowing that um, I don't know whether Fifth can can speak. Fifth is not well, and I think mm -hmm. it's really brave that she's still in the room um but she's ill and she's written a, a a chapter on research ethics responsibility and research in the first book actually in the in the book series of the post call uh, it's called navigating oh. there it is yeah hold up <laughs> navigating the post call i think it's is it chapter eight i'll tell you chapter something Seven. yeah Seven. Chapter six. Mm -hmm. yeah so it's um you might um you know email us and then we can <laughs> or shall we just put it you're not you're not on the on the whatsapp group are you our whatsapp group uh no i just re i just saw it here i just got your screen open from your website i saw you on facebook this is how i connected on facebook oh fabulous uh, fabulous okay yeah, so I, we're 11 o'clock here to this morning Okay, because we actually have, we've got reading groups, we've got all sorts of events. So what we can do is yeah. if you, if you, e if you send your email address in the chat, then we can email you the chapter if that's okay with you, Viv. And uh, it might be really helpful to give you a little bit. So for yeah, even send it maybe or use it <laughs> with a committee. And, um, 
and also then George might want to, you know, can give you some more information about, you know, how, how we normally communicate um, and how we work together and think together yeah. as a group. As a that would be that would be fantastic. The more I can join other groups, it's a very small world here at PEI. Beautiful, <laughs> <laughs> but small. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Viv Shame, Viv Sidious in the in the chat. Fine with me, mm. Sis Viv. Okay, great. Thank you. So back to Ezra. Ezra, I know you're still grappling, you're still in your process. Um, yeah. but how did or how are the questions that you initially started with? How are they driving you um, and your re research? And how are they shifting through this process of research? If you want to spend a couple of minutes telling us about that. Um, yeah, I think that the, the biggest way, the way that they've been shifting has been kind of quadrupling down on the post qualitative aspect of my work. And, you know, uh, I, in answer to Karen's question, <clears throat> I both, I feel like I both identify with and would answer um like elizabeth adam st pierre has a um short you know plenary address or something about post qualitative inquiry and she mentions a few times you know like it's not qualitative inquiry with a twist it's something different and it's not like a refusal of qualitative inquiry um so i kind of both see it as something different and i also kind of see it as something like it's sort of more like what I thought we were doing the whole time with qualitative inquiry. I don't know if that speaks at all to what you were saying, Hillary, <laughs> you know, but like my experience coming into grad school, I'm reading these papers. In fact, one paper on affect in science that was really powerful to me, written by uh, a graduate student that was just coming out of my same program as I was coming in. Um, reading her work, you know, the, there's like, one paragraph on methodology it's very short there's data and analysis sections but to me it just sounds it looks all the same kind of like description of what happened and i just took that to mean at the time like that's just how you do it, it we're building a story here of how we understand that you know and so that's what i did <laughs> and then uh, I felt like I got a lot of pushback as if, you know, it wasn't basically rigorous en enough. And it was confusing for me just because I sort of thought that it wasn't any less rigorous than the other work, you know. So for me, post qualitative research is a little bit about uh, being very upfront with everything that you can think of that you're doing you know my whole purpose here is to tell a story about what i think happened and i'm going to try my best to not over represent what's happening as the truth or i try my best to like include myself in the analysis um as how i tell that story um so my research questions went from like trying to find claims that I could say about uh, like conversa disciplinary conversations in STEM to reading more and having a, just a sort of a web of touch points to kind of help myself understand my own work as um, telling a story about STEM that uh, might have a different kind of power and create kind of like a different kind of reality for how we approach STEM. Um, and that that also was part of a contribution. Um, and, oh, I remembered also that I had forgotten to mention what had w worked for me in that mm -hmm. process and I was thinking of um also from that same paper by um St. Pierre uh she mentions to just keep reading and writing at the edge of incompetence <laughs> and so for me that's been a really good reminder to 
and it has worked pretty well to just keep writing and making connections to literature, but also like to people like this um, to help. And for me, that's helped me. I think it's helped me realize that the ways that I'm, I've been struggling are the right ways. You know, like I think over the last few years, I've started to feel gradually more like like an expert is what I'm thinking of, but it feels very strange to say that, <laughs> like, because I, I still mean like expert-esque. And mm -hmm. part of what I mean is that I imagine that even the experts in this field don't really think of themselves as experts because it's kind of a, a field where you're intentionally trying to stay new. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, I, th I think uh, the one question about how did my research questions shift um, is mainly in becoming more and more explicitly post-qualitative. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ezra. So I suppose um, I'm gonna ask if we can um, think about what Ezra said and maybe if there are people in the room who have had some kind of journey with their own research questions and want to think about what it means, even I suppose for people like Karen and Viv with papers that you're writing, <laughs> how, um, yeah, what, what, what's, what's happening that's moving this in a particular, and I wouldn't say direction because we're not thinking of forward or backward, but yeah, just maybe somebody wants to comment on either what Ezra, ask Ezra a follow-up question around his idea of questions or any comments from anyone. Let's take 30 seconds to just think for a second, but just let's think a bit. <laughs> but I know, um, there's a fly bothering me, but I'm trying not to be bothered. <laughs> Think about it for 30 seconds, please. Zen Elsa wants to say something, I think. Oh, sorry, Elsa. Yeah, no, go not, ahead. Not to apologize. I didn't want to interrupt people's thinking processes, but what was it, what what was going going through my head was uh, and I, I suspect I may have you may have already addressed this, but what makes a research question post qualitative rather than qualitative? Did you already have that conversation? No. Yeah. Okay. Because you just you said that your research question is now more post qualitative. And I'm just wondering what I mean, it's difficult to put a finger on that, but how would you say that was the case? Mm. Can, I, can I put one on top of that? <laughs> Which was, that's where I started as well. And then I thought, is it the questions that change mm. and or does also the subject matter change? So, mm. and I was thinking, I'm still, I was struck this morning in our reading group again by that, um, we're reading the second chapter on the fraction and I think it's page 88 or 87, something like that, where they talk about how the, um, in the fraction, as opposed to reflection, that, that what you're reflecting or diffracting through changes, right? So it's, it's, so the past, so now in your case, you would, your research is constantly changing. And now again, you know, iteratively, we you are remaking your research as you are talking here. So, so it's adding to your question in a way, or diffracting through your question, Elsa, this idea about mm. is it a question and or the subject matter that changes? Can I add something else? <laughs> and and or the method, you know. Mm -hmm. is, that may be what's meant by theory method, where you can't actually separate the question, the method, the yeah. subject, mm -hmm. they constantly 
interacting with each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I would add one more um, <laughs> because I was struck by um, what you said, Ezra, when you said you stay new. And that's one of the things I did look up when I was preparing for today was thinking about how, um, I mean, I could read it and it's close to the page that you're on, Karen. Um, this idea that Barad offers a diffractive pattern marking difference from within and as part of an entangled state. So when I talk about my thesis, the chapters, I was, I'll read what I wrote, the chapters of my thesis perform this diffractive pattern with and through the diffractive methodology. A diffractive pattern emerges which is not preformed, it enacts the new that is continually produced, but then I would add, so because I am implied, I'm in, you know, I am in this research as opposed to what we thought before. So then I, as I, if I could be this I, and I'm not a singular subject, am also new. Um, Made in new. Mm. So, mm. yeah, so I think. Mm. Mm. Then. Sorry, but I'm. Mm -hmm. so, so we uh, just. Uh, yeah, should I answer you're that? Not, you're not being expected <laughs> to answer, but you're please engage with the question. And I do see that David has a, um, a comment as well. So <laughs> go ahead. Well, why don't you go first, David? <laughs> Add Thank one more you. question. <laughs> Are you sure? Are you? Yeah. Thank you so much. No, I just wanted to um, ask about your research questions. If you're asking anything about the other than human. Mm participants are acting there's something that came up for me that's that's why I wanted to ask you because that's something that a question about I've asked myself about my research questions yeah. yeah um thanks yeah so I don't know so there's two I guess there's too many questions now because I just want to answer yes somehow um <laughs> but <laughs> you know I think a story of a little bit more of the details of my trajectory might also help answer some of those. Cause I think that yes, my, it's not like my research questions are post qualitative on their own because the entire business is itself becoming post qualitative. My approach with the questions, but I can, but I can kind of tell you how I shaped um, what I'm doing and kind of why I think of it as post qualitative. So. I went into grad school with uh, thinking, teaching, and thinking a lot about the ways that mathematics is not framed as storytelling, but it's integral to mathematics. I think that uh, mathematical proof is shares a lot more in common with a joke than people would think. Um, and I think that they don't think that because they forget that some jokes are bad jokes. Not every joke makes you laugh very well, you know, <laughs> but like, I think that a good math proof should have a setup and tell a story and then have like a punchline that gives you a particular <laughs> emotional state. And that the point of the proof is to share that emotional state of like the eureka moment. And that's totally opposite from the idea of math as this emotionless realm, you know? Um, and it's easy to sort of not see that coming or not even agree because if your experience of math is as boring and dry and painful, then you might not think of it as exciting, but that's, I just think of that the same way that if you go to a stand-up comedy show and the comic is bad and it's just not funny. They're still jokes, <laughs> they're just not funny. Um, <laughs> so I went in thinking about that and thinking about emotion. And I mentioned already how I read that paper on emotion in science and it felt very post-qualitative to me already, the analysis section. And so as I was trying to write about conversations and also put together like moments that helped me explain that idea of the storytelling and affect that's inherent in math um, and that I would say characterizes it. Uh, 
because for instance, another really important thing to recognize, I think, is that the, the feeling of thinking that you're like moving logically through an argument um, dispassionately or, you know, in a sober way, uh, that's an affective state. You know, that like mm -hmm. absence of affect isn't really an absence. It's a kind of like calm waters. You're not out of the water. You're still in, you're still in it. But um, that is an affective state. Also, I think that mathematics kind of communicates. Mm -hmm. um, so as I was thinking about telling those stories, like I'm just trying to communicate my ideas around that. And the way that my, like the way that I was thinking about that, I mentioned how, as I started to look at the data in the computational physics course, I started trying to like find evidence for conversations, but that shifted. And I was also at the same time looking around at examples that could help me tell this story of emotion in math. In math. Um, and around that time, I, I read Halberstam's Queer Art of Failure, and it really resonated with me. And, you know, it's never really mentioned in the same breath as post-qualitative, but I feel like their formulation of low theory is, is really in line with post-qualitative research. Um, I read that first before I had encountered the word post-qualitative and it, and the idea of like coming across knowledge as you find it and piecing it together in like a, theory that just makes sense to you in some way as like an actual way to break, to like make new knowledge and break out of the kind of uh, ruts that we might get into with um, a high theory that uh, reproduces the kind of power structure that makes, that determines what's high and what's low theory. Um, that idea led me to like collecting a bunch of eccentric examples uh, that told this story of emotion in math. So as I read more about post-qualitative research and diffraction, I started to shape that idea into like the way that I think about that piece now is that I'm, interested in thinking about emotion and affect in math. And I'm, I'm thinking about the ways that disciplinary relationships are shaped by affect and sort of the relationship between affect and math. And that focus on the relationship is how I think of like a strongest, my strongest connection to diffraction, because I'm, I, I really like that idea that diffraction, through looking at those, you know, the interference pattern that emerges between waves, um, I, the idea that you're not looking at things, you're looking at a relationship. So I, I think of it like if I'm investigating a relationship, if I'm trying to investigate a relationship, then using diffraction as a methodology can make sense in kind of a way. And, and for me, I have a chapter that sort of uses, I call it diffraction, but I'm also kind of referencing Halberst Halberstam to kind of build a collection of examples of emotion in like inherent inher inherent to mathematics that can tell some of that story of how um, math involves like a kind of if you were to think of it as a conversation like a conversation within yourself in a way. Um, sure. Ezra, I'm going to 
I'm going to interrupt. Yeah, I hope I'm not interrupting as you as you ending, but I am um, just because of time. But thank you for I suppose relationship relations is what you're talking. But there are some comments in the chat which I think may be helpful, and we'll you know hopefully we can get a couple more um, comments from people. Constantinos, I don't know if you'd like to ask your question, um, and then Viv, who isn't able to speak, has answered and given some suggestions. Constantinos. Yes, hello to everyone. Thank you very much for this um, very intriguing opportunity to, to discuss this uh, mind spinning issues because it was um, my recent journey was a little bit the same with Fezras, but I didn't have the opportunity to have this kind of discussions because it happened in a quite isolated um, it was a quite isolated experience. And I was thinking because my idea was I felt that while I was uh, uh, in a point where my data were saturating or saturated enough, or I don't know how to how to describe it, I was um, felt really obliged or institutionalized to put all these thoughts into into paper, let's say, because we are also doing uh, uh, PhD thesis that happens within an institution, and we always have all these uh, time frameworks. And uh, I was, uh, uh, I was actually, I was made to 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 put to crystallize my thinking and my thoughts into paper, which is not very bad, of course. But I always felt that I needed more time to to engage more with my uh, my data. So my question to Ezra would be: How do you decide then when to stop doing this very iterative process and start uh, putting it into words, which is uh, for sure a crystallization of this process, and it creates a, a certain or structure. It gives a certain structure to your uh, pretty much. Uh, unstructured thoughts, feelings, and and materials. Let's say. Thanks, Constantus. Yeah, uh, I guess for me, thinking about um, each each of those steps through the lens of like performativity, um, sort of changes where you see the boundaries between those things, even. Um, if, you know, writing is a performative act, then each mm -hmm. iteration of writing a draft is itself a performative story. But reading as a performance that the author and the reader or the text or the, the world um, interacts, interacts with, with you um, is, a, is also a performance that uh, changes the reader you know so I I think I think when I'm reading new stuff and processing it's a lot more similar than I might otherwise think to writing it out in each case I'm kind of interacting in a way that iteratively with each performance kind of refines my ideas um, so that now my dissertation chapters as, you know, as a thing, my dissertation chapter kind of looks like a version of my thoughts that I've shaped. Um, that, so, and so I guess I see more continuity in that than, than I think I used to. When I'm reading even you know, when I'm reading anything, I'm kind of taking a lot of notes. I I happen to use Acrobat Reader and take, you know, write long comments. Sometimes just short comments, sometimes a highlight, sometimes some swear words, sometimes a long like paragraph of like how I think this connects to other things. And then I start refining those notes and those memos become different things that then eventually get shaped into uh, something that looks more like a chapter. Thank you, Ezra. Ezra, um, Karen, I'm going to ask Karen because she has to leave at five and I'm, I'm hoping that the rest of us can stay maybe just five more minutes. 
And before I read the comments and the helpful suggestions from Viv and Hilary, Karen, do you want to say one comment about where you are in the conversation at the moment or before you leave? You don't have to, but. No, I think there's so many comments in there and people are responding to each yeah. other. So I was just going to slip out. Unfortunately, <laughs> I've got to host a, ne a next meeting. So it's I say goodbye and I'll see you again. And lovely to see some. Do I say I say old faces? No, it's not how what I mean. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Bye. Um, and we we will try and honor the time. I know it's difficult. We said four to five, so I'll just try and do maybe if people can stay a couple more minutes. We'll read the last couple of comments, and then we did have one more question, and we can see if we can get to that. Um, Viv answered Constantinus Constantinus's um question in this way she said and I suppose it would be for you Ezra St. Pierre would say you are doing inquiry through writing you are learning and becoming in writing it is a methodology in itself which sort of speaks about what what you were saying to um Ezra about I think then, it would have been much shorter if I, had <laughs> yeah, I was going to try and help you and then I'm teasing yeah it was <laughs> but but it's actually what it speaks to what you were saying so that's I'm sure you find that affirming um and then Viv also asked if you use the work of Liz de Freitas and Nathalie Sinclair in your work on mathematics in particularly the, the work on mathematics and the body which is a lot about affect and mathematics and Viv recommended their book to me and I use their it's quite incredible are you Cool. And then um, Elsa asked us to put something in the chat. Sorry, I don't know what that was. And then Hilary has also written about Ezra. There's been a project by a visiting prof at my university called I Hate Math, which works to work with negative affects in relation to math. And then Karen just gave her apologies. Um, Ezra, did you want to comment about mathematics in the body or? Um, yeah, just that uh, that work is great. And I haven't, I don't use it very directly, um, but and I came across it after I had developed sort of some of my approach, but I found it super interesting because they basically do, I felt like they do a very similar thing to what I was attempting, except took a different approach. They think of the idea of embodiment and discourse and expand sort of the definition of a body in order to encapsulate affect and then bodies of people at like an interpersonal scale and um and then bodies of assemblages and um and you know material and more than human um <clears throat> whereas i expand the definitions of speech and listening and conversations to sort of do the opposite. I, I want to call all of those things discourse. And instead of make, calling everything one thing and calling it embodiment, I kind of make temporary separations so that like my conversations with the more than human world, well, I think of more than human at each of those scales, but my conversations with material or theory or conversations with interpersonal people or or even within myself sort of enacting a separation to think of a conversation with my own emotions and with my own body. So it's both similar and kind of opposite, which I found really interesting. Great. And Ezra, if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask the last question and ask you to kind of see if you can do two minutes and then maybe we can have a quick go around. Um, and so my last question to you and to certainly to the members of the, to us that are together to, here tonight, um, what works in what works in supervision when doing post qualitative research? So you can answer this. I know you said you didn't have too many positive experiences, possibly, but maybe in a justice to come kind of way. You know, what if we could imagine this? What would it be like? What what should supervisors do? What could they know? What could be better? How could this be more life giving? Not that the opposite of life is death. Okay. <laughs> No, I, I mean, I had I had a good experience. It was hard at times feeling like I had to uh, justify my work more than I, you know, I had to like develop an ability to justify my work that I didn't really know beforehand. I was going to need to do that as like robustly. 
But even those people that were skeptical were very trusting that I knew what I was talking about. Or you, not that I knew what I was talking about, but they trusted that to me, it made sense. <laughs> and they wanted to help me you know, continue to have it make more sense. So they, even the people that were the most skeptical were still very supportive in a lot of ways. So it really helped to have the people around me assuming that the things that, assuming that I had things that I was experiencing and trying to communicate that, um, that were valuable in some way that they wanted to like develop, you know, um, thinking of the resources that I would bring to um, my dissertation in the field in general. So I had a lot of people uh, just trying to help in every way that they could, you know. Um, and my advisor uh, in particular, like, was great about like trying to like read along and stuff um and just like get in there with me mm -hmm. um so i feel like the things that worked were just the people around me even even at times that they might have been a little uncomfortable were still willing to get a bit weird you know, and like try to get in there. Uh, and and that was really supportive. Mm. Um, Isra, I'm gonna say thank you to you. I know that we could carry on and maybe that's always the nature of an inquiry. We never end because the questions will continue to develop other questions and we are left with the questions, but not, and we've developed these questions collectively too. So if there's a comment that somebody would like to make in maybe 30 seconds, I would invite that. But then I do think we need to close so that we can move on to those other important things. And so while you're thinking about your comment, I'd like to thank Ezra. It's it's um, it's a vulnerability that we need to encourage in academia where we can talk about the work we're doing with the love that it requires, but also be open to listening and learning and hearing from other people. So Ezra, I'd like to say thank you to you for sharing with us today. Uh, many people are trying to embark on this kind of similar process and you've op you opened, I mean, I also write in my PhD about the people who there's some people that push the door jar and there's some people that open it really wide and some of them show you where to jump over the fence. And so you've done that hopefully. And, and I think in some ways for the people in this room. Um, and then we also are going to be having similar in the next two weeks, we're having two more returnings. And so if George is ready, she can tell us who will be here next week and the week after. Oh, George, we can't hear you yet. Sorry. No. I muted myself. We can. Oh, okay. Thank you. Nice. Lovely. My computer does strange things sometimes. Um, so next week, uh, the 22nd, at the same time, mm -hmm. we will be joined by Simone Blom from Southern Cross University. And oh my gosh, I have to say wrong, but Roya Fatali Zade, Fatali Zade from Arizona State University. Great. Um, Thank you. And the 29th? Um, the 29th will be joined by Anna Pilsen mm -hmm. and, um, oh, um, is it Maria? It's Marie. Um, also, uh, excuse the pronunciation, but Istanis Gerolstadt. Um, so we, I will send out communications on Facebook. Those who get it by email. And then of course, also all the what, active WhatsApp groups. So I think most likely tomorrow I will send out the um, invitation for next week and then the same um, the week after. But um, for anyone, okay. if, you, if, if there's anyone who wasn't able to be here today um, that you think would really benefit from hearing Ezra's um, journey, but also obviously all of the interesting discussions that we've had, then also it will be available on YouTube. So you can please feel free to share it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Ezra, was there something you would, would like to end with? Oh, yeah, no, no. Um, Ezra, is there anything or anybody else would just like to send us off with, with some thought or a question? 
just a thank you again, I think, yeah. Great, okay. Thanks everyone, be safe as you get out of your chair. I mean, even that could be complex and move out of the circle into the world that you are part of. So thanks for being here today. Look forward to seeing you next week if you're able to make it and please join join the reading groups and join the WhatsApps to find out what we're doing. And thanks to everyone for sharing on the group and Viv, get better soon. <laughs> thanks everyone. Hi, thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs>